How many of you have jobs that involve more mental work, more mental labor than physical work? Show of hands. Whoa. Doctors, accountants, lawyers. That's most of you. And I'm one of them too. And I've got some news for you all today. Over the next 20 years, more will change in the way we work than that has happened in the last 2,000 years. We are the dawn of a new age in human history. We had the agricultural age, we had the industrial age, and then we had the digital age. And now we've entered what's called the age of augmented intelligence. And in this age, our natural cognitive and mental abilities will be expanded, will be extended, amplified, and augmented with external intelligence. And that's going to change the way we think, the way we reason, the way we decide, and the way we do work. For millennia, our species has been on a quest to expand and amplify our core human capabilities. And for most part until now, the focus has been on expanding our bodies, our physical ability to do things. And we did that by creating artificial strength or artificial power in the form of steam, gas, and electricity that did not rely on human muscles. It made the machines do most of the physical labor for us. And now we're going to do the exact same thing with our minds and our intelligence. We are going to reproduce our intelligence in computing systems and in machines. And that's going to change the way we think, the way we do work. And now these machines are not just going to do physical labor for us, they're also going to take on complex cognitive tasks. When I talk to people about this, they think of this as some technological voodoo. Those involved in casting spells like myself would prefer to call that artificial intelligence or AI, most specifically machine learning. It's making machines learn to do things on their own so that they can do that autonomously. They can reason and think and decide and act on their own. And when they do this, they're going to operate at a much different scale to how we operate. And they're going to do it perhaps very differently to how we've been doing it. And the way we go about it is, we write specialized computing code. We call that learning algorithms. And we add that to the machines and the applications that we've been using today. Not just physical machines. It could be digital services like Google and Facebook and Netflix. They all already, they have a lot of AI algorithms working in the background, you know, tagging images with people names, helping you find answers, recommending movies, and, and so on. And these algorithms are modeled on the human brain exactly the way we think and the way we learn. We learn from examples, observations, and repeated practice. You know, we observe phenomena, we capture in facts, we process that information, and based on that understanding, we take certain choices. And over time, we become better at making those choices. And that's how we become an expert at anything. And AI algorithms work in a very similar way. They work from based on examples, observations, and repeated practice. Have a look at that picture. That's my four-year-old son. When he saw that animal for the first time, this is a few days ago, when he saw that animal for the first time, he called it an orangutan. He'd never seen that before. The closest was he saw a few pictures in his books, and he learned from that. He did not need a lot of information to learn about this animal. It's a simple task in many ways, but he did not need a lot of information to learn. His little brain has gone through eons and eons of evolution that he could just quickly, rapidly learn this. People, especially children, are remarkably good at this concept called in induction. You know, they take a small set of examples, they can extrapolate and generalize that to a broader concept very rapidly. Humans are very fast learners that way. And AI works very similarly. But it's a slow learner, a very slow learner. Not in terms of speed, but the amount of information it needs before it can make sense out of something is a longer process. For it to, let's say, identify orangutans, it needs thousands and thousands of pictures of orangutans before it can start to make sense of it. But when it learns, when it learns to identify this animal in this case, it can perform at superhuman speed and accuracy. It can sift through a million images of animals and identify and pick orangutans under a second. Think about that. You see, AI works phenomenally well at scale and, and speed, surpassing human capabilities. And it's not just identifying objects and images. You can get it to do anything. 
anything that you have lots of examples of, and some rules on how to use that example. You showed examples of how to read language, and it learns to read language. You showed examples of how to speak, and it learns language, and it produces speech. You show it language, you show it how to play a game, and it learns how to play a game. It learns the moves, and in most cases, these days, it's playing it better than human champions. You showed how to talk, and it learns how to talk. Have a listen to what I'm about to play next. It's a conversation between an AI and a human. Try and guess which one's which. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. How many things the first one, Lisa, that's making the call to book an appointment? Show of hands. And how many think it's the, uh, the second person taking the appointment in? Sure, fans. Oh, there's a mixed response. You see how human-like, how close they are. It is, it is Lisa in this case, the first one that's making the call. That's how good we are with speech technology today. And that was an entertaining example, right? But the application of this is, is very deep these days. We are trying to experiment with that technology to offer emotional support to people suffering with certain mental conditions. We're trying to use that to take hundreds of phone calls during a disaster response, a similar technology. The applications are, are limitless. We've, we've never seen anything like this in the technology world before. This new way of computing, you know, teaching machines how to do things, and then they go on their own, you set goals and you set challenges, and they work in the background continuously at a, at a much larger scale. This has never happened before, and I believe with this technology, we can take on some of our long-standing and most pressing challenges, some of our wicked challenges that we've had in front of us. All of these have been, just been large-scale problems, and therefore, it was a big challenge. Things like climate change, poverty, pressing health issues. And my confidence comes from what I see every day in my work. Some of our brightest minds are the frontiers of AI research and its application. I'll give you an example. Take skin cancer, one of our biggest killers. Four Australians die every day because of melanoma. Approximately two to three Australians will be diagnosed with some form of skin condition before they turn 70. You see, it's a huge problem. But as deadly as skin cancer is, treating it early on has increased very high survival rates. The survival rates go up to 98% if it is detected and screened early on. The question then is, why aren't we screening it early on? Why aren't we able to manage this? The answer is, we do not have enough people to do that. We have less than 1,000 expert dermatologists who can, who can do that today in our country. It takes over 10 years for someone to get trained in, in that field. We're literally capped by the intelligence that's available to us from these experts. And we want to tackle this with AI. We want to lift that cap off. About two years ago, IBM, the company that I used to work with at that time, partnered with Melanoma Institute of Australia and MoleMap. And we showed an AI algorithm 40,000 images of skin conditions, along with expert diagnosis. And the algorithm learned from that. It learned variations in color, variations in border, symmetry, and the, the interconnection between the expert diagnosis, and it learned from that. It learned to detect skin cancer. And the results just stunned us. Today, non-specialists, GPs and clinicians, could detect skin cancer at about 60% accuracy. And with specialized equipment and cameras, that gets pushed to about 80%, as good as expert dermatologists. 
This algorithm that we trained was detecting skin cancer at 91% accuracy. That's more than expert dermatologists. And that 31% increase in accuracy literally meant life versus death in many cases. And similar, similar experiments were conducted in other parts of the world. And the more we showed these algorithms, examples, and samples of certain conditions, the better they became and more accurate they became at detecting it. Today, you could download something with this capability onto your phone, and you can screen for skin cancer at home. Applications like Skin Vision, for example, cost about $50 a year. And you can use it as many number of times as you want on as many people as you like. Right now, you have the ability to spot skin cancer more accurately than the world's leading dermatologist, and that intelligence is available to you in your pocket through your phone. That intelligence, which was otherwise outside the realm of your intelligence, and now you're augmented and extended, your intelligence is extended with the, the expert intelligence of, in this case, the dermatologist. It's not just skin cancer and medicine. Another similar application called Plantix helps farmers take pictures of their crops and they instantly get you know, how much water they should be putting or how much fertilizers they must be cutting down on. Again, expert intelligence to you when and where you need it. But when you hear the word artificial intelligence, you don't, you don't think of skin cancer and farming and Plantix. AI is such a loosely used terminology these days. And the deep influence of Hollywood hasn't helped. <laughs> It's left large swaths of people with the understanding that either this is some kind of a threatening new technology that's going to take all our jobs and turn us all into paper clips, <laughs> or a senseless speaker that sits on my kitchen shelf and remembers my shopping list. You see, it's, it's more than that. We've got to make an attempt to understand what this technology can and cannot do today. AI is going to be our partner. It's going to be an assistant. Going forward, more and more augmented intelligence will be part of almost everything we do. Our future is working in partnership with these machines and in collaboration with these machines. All new technology have risks, and AI is no small technology. But we have to be careful about these risks. We have to manage them. We have to be more responsible and cautious, like we've been with other powerful technologies in the past. But that thought shouldn't deter us from the progress that we can make with it today. We can save lives today with this technology. And you've seen one example. Today, AI can be seen as a tool, a very powerful tool, nevertheless. And it's going to be that way for some foreseeable future. It's going to help us to do what we do better. I want you all to take this understanding of AI and think, how could you do what you do better? How could you do what you do at a much larger scale? And how can your expertise be replicated and reproduced and perhaps sent to a place where it is most needed? Most importantly, in the age of augmented intelligence, how differently will you be working? AI is going to cause a technological revolution. Innovation will spur and economies will transform. No doubts about it. We've had this in the past with industrial revolution. It's going to be an age of amazement. It's going to be our biggest opportunity to invent and to, have, to relook at some of these pressing challenges that we've had in front of us. It's going to be exciting. And I want you all to be excited about this and get involved and perhaps be an innovator during the most important part of our human history. I want you all to get some skin in the game. Thank you. <laughs>